good afternoon all and welcome all. I would want to start the official meeting today of the 28th session of the Joint Select Committee on National Security. This afternoon, we are about, as this committee is always about, we are about some very serious business pertaining to crime in Trinidad and Tobago. We have invited and we want to welcome the Commissioner of Police, Mrs. Erla Hayward Christopher. We want to welcome the Acting Deputy Commissioner of Police, Mr. Ramnarine Samaru. We want to welcome Senior Superintendent, Mr. Kurt Simon, and Senior Superintendent, Mr. Rishi Singh. My name is Keith Scotland. I'm the chairman of this committee. And the members of the support team are Mr. Brian Caesar, the clerk of the House, Ms. Crystal Gittens, senior parliamentary research specialist, Mr. Chad Salandi, parliamentary research specialist, and Mr. Roger Hector, legal officer. I will now invite the members of the committee beginning with the Vice Chairman, to introduce themselves to the public. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner and team. Happy New Year. Paul Richards, Vice Chair. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Commissioner and team. Welcome. Nice to see you again. Ayanna Webster Roy, member. Good afternoon, everyone. Commissioner, your team, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, Richie Sakai, member. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Commissioner and your team. Uh, Rudolph Monilal, member. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us again. Jayanti Lachmidial, member. Let me now ask the Commission and her team to introduce themselves to the public. Good afternoon, everyone. Erla Christopher, Commissioner of Police. Good afternoon to the committee. I am Deputy Commissioner Acting Mr. Ramarine Samaru. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair. I'm Kurt Simon, Senior Superintendent, Acting ACP. Of police. Good evening again. Good afternoon to members of the committee and members of the listening public. My name is Rishi Singh, Senior Superintendent, Homicide. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Parliament Channel 11, Parliament Radio 105.5 FM, and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Pal View. The guidelines for this session is very simple. The questions will be posed through the chair. I'll remind members and um, members of your team, Madam Commissioner, when you are finished speaking, to mute your mics, please, so that we don't have any feedback and that other persons will be able to attract the attention of whoever either is asking the question or who the question is being asked of. Today's topic is a follow-up on the inquiry to gain an understanding of the anti-crime strategies implemented and being implemented to address criminal activities in Trinidad and Tobago with the following objectives. To understand the short, medium, and long-term strategies implemented by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service since we last held a meeting here and since, Madam Commissioner, you and your team appeared before this committee. Two, to learn of specific measures engaged by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to ensure public safety. Three, to explore strategies to combat the open brazenness of criminality in Trinidad and Tobago. Four, to establish approaches to combat the increasing 
incidence of school violence and five to consider measures implemented for improved detection madam commissioner we will invite you to give a very brief opening speech no more than three minutes and then we will commence the interrogation thank you very much chair first let me say that it is our pleasure and we really appreciate the opportunity to come before this body again to account for the work of the police 2023 has been a challenging year for the police as we continue to confront our brazen yes innovative and determined criminal criminal elements we would have implemented our anti-crime strategies although we may not have achieved the targets we had set because these targets were actually a bit stretched because we know what is required we did see some successes in terms of homicides we did defy the projections and not have an increase but yes a relatively small decrease but it is still notable the police we are best known to deal with our law enforcement and we have committed and we continue to commit to the safety and security of the nation thank you you're very welcome madam commissioner madam commissioner my calculation tells me that come february the third you'll have an, a year in office tell the country how was your first year in office as commissioner of police and do you think that you have achieved the goals and objectives that you set out to do thank you chair well the first year my first year in office was indeed challenging challenging both on the inside internal and external because you know with changes with changes you will have challenges and the external i think um our partners our stakeholders could have done a little more could do a little more in supporting the organization and supporting crime fighting as i would always say that crime fighting is not just a job for the police and it needs a whole of society approach so yes it was challenging but but not impossible you 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 spoke about the the fact that you have not gotten the support from the stakeholders i su i suppose you mean members of the public what do you think is accounting then for the lack of the public confidence in 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 in, in, in the police well lack of public confidence i know some of my officers may have contributed to the public not having the confidence that we require <coughs> but however i want to note want you to note that in terms of building the public trust and confidence as an organization the executive we have taken a zero tolerance approach to police ill discipline and that is obvious in the number of officers who would have been brought before the court just in 2023 how many officers were there madam would you say about approximately 58 58 officers the violent crime reduction plan was described by your organization as the answer to the urgent need for the implementation of robust anti-crime initiatives that will be effective in delivering a significant reduction in the incident of violent crime you remember that plan yes yes how were the objectives and targets and implementation measures determined chair 
we would have taken a holistic view of the crime situation and of the organization. And we came up with this, what we will consider a comprehensive plan that take into consideration the precision policing of the power few. In this plan, we looked at dismantling or the dismantling of criminal gangs, the retrieval of illegal firearms, the eradication of drug blocks. We have an increased focus on transnational crime, we look at enhancing the intelligence capability of the police, leveraging the technology to enhance police operations. We looked at to build police legitimacy and trust and confidence. Increase police presence and visibility. Improving the quality of the police response. Increasing accountability through greater management and supervision of police operations. Trust. Increasing detection and prosecution of violent offenders. Improving road management and exhibiting a zero tolerance position on police indiscipline and corruption. There, could, you, could you tell us and tell, tell the public, and I want to go to the very meat of it, do you have a mechanism inherent in that plan that can deal and allow for any amendments or tweaking of that plan based on recent development, if there's an upsurge in one area, do you have a flexibility in that plan? Yeah, yes, yes, there is. Actually, the plan is frequently reviewed and updated as required because we have several, we have the crime is dynamic, crime is dynamic and the environment. So some, some divisions need a different type of policing. So definitely, yes, we review. And have you made changes to arrest the situation that would give this country and the, member, and the citizenry a greater sense of safety and security? Yes, what, what we are focusing on is bringing greater management to the anti-gang anti operations. So what we have done is enable a, a specific team that will focus on the dismantling of gangs. And yes, we have seen some successes because we have been successful in disrupting gang activities in several areas. So you, you're not, you, you're dismantling by disrupting? Well, if you take the legislation into consideration, there, there's a process yes. by which we must bring office, um, criminals to the court, gang members to the court. So yes, we will focus on dismantling, on disrupting the activities as we continue to do our due, due diligence and our intelligence work to bring down the gangs. Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon again, Commissioner and team. Thank you for being here. Let me start with some good news. Um, she smiles. <laughs> and, and a personal experience, I went to Panorama on Sunday night and I walked from uh, my offices, our offices on Abercrombie Street up um, to the Savannah. And I have to say, I felt very safe. I felt that the organization from the TGPS and, and your stakeholder uh, groups were very organized. It was well lit, they were officers all the way through. And, um, and I heard similar sentiments from members of the public. And I have not heard any untoward events from that so far, so congratulations. And that I hope that continues through the carnival period. So you see, we try to be balanced, <laughs> right? So that's, 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 the, um, that's the good start. The, of course, we have to get down to the meat of the matter. Um, it's the start of the year, and we're heading into one of the greatest festivals in the world. We are on display. Uh, you identified some strategies uh, to the chair earlier on. Uh, and you set some targets that you would ach achieve as at December 31st, 2023. You did indicate at the start you did not meet the targets. Uh, there, was a th and there were 11 specific targets identified, 30% detection rate for violent crimes, 30% detection rate for homicides, 15% increase in firearm retrieval rate, 15% reduction in serious crime, 20% reduction in homicides, 
20% reduction in violent crimes, 10% reduction in last name motor vehicles, 5% reduction in fatal road traffic accidents. Uh, and you also identified 20 persons charged under the Anti-Gang Act, 40 priority offenders arrested and charged, and 20 priority offenders successfully prosecuted. Can you identify which of these uh, targets were met? Uh, if those were met, what were the strategies that were successful? And the ones that were not met, can you identify specific uh, statistics as at the end of 2023 compared to what the targets were? So we can get a sense of what the success rate was, the benchmark was, how far you came, how close you came to achieving the targets. And if they were not achieved, why do you think you did not, you were not able to achieve it? And what were the main contributing factors? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Un we were unable to achieve any of the targets because the targets were were a bit exaggerated. However, what, what does that mean? Well, if we looked at previous our previous achievements over the years, we would have seen that these targets were never really met. So it was ambitious, an, amb an ambitious target to sort of encourage the officers to really work towards reaching that target. We, however, if I can just give me one minute. We had set, <coughs> excuse, a 20% reduction in murders. We, we did achieve uh, just about a five, a five, a 5% reduction, a 5% reduction. Compared to the previous to, year. Compared to the previous year. And uh, as we go into 2024, we will maintain that same 15, the same 20%. We would, in terms of violent crime, in terms of violent crime reduction, we would have had Just one minute, please. Take your time. We will have work towards a 20% reduction in violent crimes. However, we were not able to achieve a 20% reduction. We, in, we, we had a 15% a 15% a 15% reduction in serious crime. And again, let me just wait one minute, just one minute. Just have some figures mix, mixed in with 2024 figures, and I don't want to mix 2024 figures. Right. A 15% reduction in serious reported crime. We just were successful in getting a 2% reduction. We had a 2% increase in the last year of motor vehicles. We had a 1% decrease in fatal RTAs. We have now a 15% a 15% detection rate for murders. We had a, instead of achieving our 30% detection rate for violent crime, we did achieve a 20% detection rate. And our firearms recovery, we had anticipated a 15% increase from 703. However, we just were successful in having a 1% increase of 700. And 
nine firearms. Uh, the, the, what would have been the strategies that led to the even marginal uh, improvements or achievements, and what do you think would have been the gaps or the shortcoming in approach or strategy in the benchmarks you were not able to achieve? If you, if you, I'm sure you've done analyses and postmortems. Well, actually, we are now in the process of doing that analysis as we go into as we go into 2024. Uh, you are you keeping these targets that you've set for 2023? You you described them as ambitious before in a bit to encourage officers. Do you think these targets are realistic? Because when you lay targets on the table for the national community, I think it's, it's, you're gonna create a credibility problem if you come after and say they were ambitious and you lay them to encourage officers when you may have known, and I'm presuming here, that they may have been quite ambitious given these circumstances. Are you, are you keeping these targets? Or do you think they are realistic targets? Or do you have targets that you think you are going to amend that are more realistic? We will amend our targets, but we must, you must know that we also um, we are given targets by the Police Service Commission. So we would have to ensure our targets are more or less um, compares to that of the Police Service Commission. So these targets that you have here were, given by, were provided by the Police Service Commission, is that what you're saying? Well, actually, the Police Service Commission did give us a 10% reduction in murder. But I... Um, I'm, but I'm I, trying not to get confused. <laughs> is it that you are setting the targets or the Commission is setting the targets set, in collaboration I, with you? No, I, set, I, I would have set our targets. All right, so these targets are going to be maintained, do you think? I, I, no, we will re review the targets. What, Sim simply because, as you, as you said, when we set the targets, then we are held to it, we don't achieve it, and then it looks as though um, the police is not achieving any of its targets. So I believe I cannot be so ambitious and set stretch targets again. Do, do you get a sense, because this also has to go with public trust and confidence, uh, you, you, you telegraph particular targets to the national community and stakeholders, and, and, and then the targets are not met. We understand it's a very volatile environment. You mentioned earlier on, you used the word the criminals are innovative. Do you think the police service is matching the innovation of the criminal element in the country? Because it's an evolving criminality, inclusive of transnational operatives. So yes, we, yes, we are. As an organization, we are striving to have an agile organization. We are ensuring we use our use technology. Additionally, to, in, to build the competency of the officers, we have embarked on specific training. We are focused on upskilling our cybercrime unit, upskilling up and, and building capacity for our research and analytical unit. We are providing training for our lawyers and court prosecutors to ensure we have better representation. So you're improving your competencies. I just have two minutes left in my round before I move on to one of my, we move on to one of my colleagues. What would you identify? I mean, and I know these are sensitive issues. You don't want to telegraph to the criminal element things that may give them an advantage. But if you had to identify main issues that would have contributed to or prevented you from achieving the main targets here, what, how would you describe those main challenges? You described uh, personal issues earlier on. Are there other factors that would have contributed to you not, the TTPS and your leadership team not being able to achieve these targets that you can share with us? No, not at this time, not that I can share with the committee. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Would you share it in writing with us, please, because we want to understand why it is sometimes targets are not met. Would you undertake to share that in writing with us, please? Yes, please, Chair. Member Munilal. Thank you very much and good afternoon again. Um, if I may, to continue the line Senator Richards was focused on, um, the 
the setting of targets, we understand that the targets are set by yourself as Commissioner of Police. Um, the Police Service Commission plays a related role in, I believe, they, they, do they um, evaluate the performance of the Commissioner of Police, I believe, yes. So the Police Service Commission has that mandate to evaluate the performance of the Commissioner of Police and the Police Commissioner sets targets for the organization, correct? Yes. Um, and you said that these targets were a bit ambitious, uh, although, I mean, the good news, if we will find the good news here, of course, is that in terms of homicide, uh, you were in the right direction going down, and it was a 5% decrease. Um, and if, if you have another 5% decrease, that would be 10% over two years um, this year. But I wanted to uh, ask the question in a, in a different way. Are there issues of organization, of resources, um, capacity that prevents the attaining a higher level of um, higher level of performance by way of reaching these targets? Notwithstanding, the targets may be set a bit high, but are there issues of resources, issues of uh, capacity, issues of of finance and so on that, that would prevent um, optimal performance to reach targets? To, to a point, but I want to say that there will always be need for additional resources. But however, I understand that finances, resources, is, that is finite, whatever. But however, I would like to share that whatever the organizations requires. We have requested in the draft estimates and allocations have been made for us to purchase all of our requirements. We, we are in the process of procuring vehicles. We did get allocation for the purchase of 234 vehicles and we are in the process of purchasing vehicles. Okay, um, and I'm, I'm happy that you raised the issue of vehicles because my related question had to do with the, you know, perennial concern. Um, while the vehicle is really one critical piece of equipment uh, among many, but that is the piece of equipment that citizens see. That is the visibility, patrols and so on. Uh, if you can just give us the uh, up-to-date status on uh, the amount of vehicles now in service, the amount um, uh, derelict, the amount awaiting repairs. And I'll, I'll tell you why I asked this question. Quite recently, just a few days ago, actually, I have a vivid example of something which I will tell you, but I will certainly not call name, and I will not even call the station. But a couple of days ago, someone passed away, elderly gentleman in South, and um, the family required to call the police station so that the police would visit and conduct whatever uh, report and so on they need to conduct so that the body would be removed. And the family was told, and this is real, I can tell you off air uh, when we are no longer alive, I can tell you the station, I can even tell you the name of the family if, if you require. But the family was told that at that station there was no police vehicle and the police could not visit the residents, the home to conduct their inquiry, do their report and the body could be removed. And that body, an elderly gentleman and so on, remained, I believe, I could be off for a couple hours, but it was 17 hours at a home. I could be wrong on the 17 hours. Let's say it was an inordinate amount of time. It was a lot of hours, and it was really unacceptable. And I say that uh, this is the response that a family would get at that moment of such you know, deep grief as well, uh, and the indignity of that. Uh, so I wanted to know the status. Now, it, it could be, the, uh, it, that story can have two parts to it, you know, you don't know. Um, do you, you know, some, in some organizations now when you call, they tell you um, this call is being recorded for quality or performance or something like that. Quality assurance. Quality assurance. Quality assurance. Is there any thought uh, to, the, to recording and having a, a server that carries all these um, call to police officers and police station and so on? so that you can track that. If it's not being done already, I don't know. 
Um, apart from the person, the, the, uh, apart from the complainant taping on their phone, is there any thought of making a, 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 an investment? On, because, you, you know, customer service is so critical in, in all law enforcement. You know, we thought when we were growing up, customer service was only for insurance people and people selling appliances and fridge and so on. But in law enforcement, is a critical factor that leads to confidence, that leads to support, participation, and so on. So uh, I wanted to, you to respond. With, uh, I, I reached there because I was asking about the status of vehicles, and I gave an example of a bad experience. So you can tell us about the vehicles, the status, um, how much we have in service, and, and whether you know, this, this is acceptable or not. Thank you so very much. May I ask to provide the information on the status of the vehicles at a subsequent or in writing, simply because I have just engaged the superintendent in charge of the transport division to provide specific information for sure. me. Sure. In terms of customer service, customer service is a very important aspect of policing and we have and we are now implementing our comprehensive customer service policy and that policy takes into consideration every aspect of contact and communication in the service. There is also involved in it a remedial approach so that in the case of St. Joseph, a team would have gone into St. Joseph and implemented a remedial training for the officers at St. Joseph. So we are, we are tight. Okay, um, I, I, I will just move to another matter now. There was a concern um, over, it was in the public domain, uh, over any type of action being taken by police officers during the carnival period. Um, and it was, it was linked to the uh, collection of back pay and so on. Do you have any up-to-date figures to uh, the amount of officers who have been paid and the amount of officers who are still um, waiting to receive their back pay at this time? Sorry, as of Thursday last, 49% of the officers were in receipt of their back pay, and that is the regular officers. In terms of the special reserve officers, of which we have 3,315, we have over 3,000 3, of them receiving their back pay. Sure. And is there a time, uh, timeline that the outstanding amounts will be paid to, the, to those affected officers? Well, we had hoped to have it paid or paid by today's date. However, that did not realize, and we are looking definitely at the end of, of February. The end of February. Um, okay, thank you. The, I took note of your um, statement on the cybercrime unit upgrading and enhancing the cybercrime unit of the TTPS. Um, Unless I'm wrong, when the, um, the, we face the October, I believe, uh, issue of the TSTT cybercrime um, attack, uh, did the, was the police involved in um, investigating this matter or assisting? No, no, the police was not involved in the investigation. And the last question for this round, uh, we always are most interested in, in having an idea of the um, operations of the CCTV camera system and the amount of coverage at this time. Um, any update for us in terms of the amount of cameras uh, um, that are working and those that are not working and, and in need of repairs? I cannot update you at this time, but what I can tell you is that there is ongoing the installation of CCTV cameras. These are new cameras new being cameras, installed yes. now, but you don't have the exact figures before you? No, I don't. And would you commit to providing that for us? Yes, I definitely will. That would be it, um, Chairman. Thank you.
Manuki member Munila. <coughs> Madam Commissioner, the, this Joint Select Committee did provide your good office with a copy of its report in December on the inquiry into the criminal justice system to determine strategies, of course, to, to combat crime. I don't know if you have seen it or if you have read it, but it was sent to your office. There's a physical look. You have not, you have not yet read it. No, Chair, I have Well, I just want to, I'm on the issue because you, you're making a point on the buy-in and the all-hands approach to, to crime, yes? So I'm on the issue now of the public confidence in the, in the police service. That report revealed that over 58% of the population in Trinidad and Tobago did not trust the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Madam Commissioner, tell this country what specific measures are you going to implement as head of the police service in Trinidad and Tobago to improve and augment the trust of the public in your organization? Chair, as an organization, we value our, our community engagement, we value our stakeholder engagement and our stakeholder partnership. What, over the past year, we would have engaged in a number of stakeholder partnerships. What I can assure you and assure the national community that the organization will continue in our engagements. What we have done and we continue to do, we hold station council meetings, we hold town meetings, we hold community meetings. What we have, what, what we have at executive level, we have instructed that each station hold at least one community meeting per month. And that is with the hope that we will have that active communication. That's the community. What about training for police officers in dealing with people or someone in your department, gaining the confidence of the public so that they can make reports on serious crime, they can gain the confidence in themselves and in the police service to make these reports? Are you undertaking any such activity? There are firms in this country who are skilled in doing the same. Are you undertaking that sort of robust and aggressive training with your members in order for them to be able to attract the confidence of the public? Yes, indeed. Actually, by November 2023, we would have trained over 2,000 of our officers in customer service. And uh, let me ask you this. That this same report, and I want, it's a, it's a vast report over 300 pages, but I want you to look at page 22, because the graph there and the statistics there reveal that over 37% of the population are very dissatisfied with the service based on their interactions with the police in 2022. So this is as late, we have a benchmark 2022. What are you going to do, madam, to improve that? As I indicated, as I indicated previously, we will be focusing on our engagements, on our community engagements, and continue to build our stakeholder relationship. We move on, Member Webster Roy. Mr. Chairman, Madam Commissioner. Clearly, you are trying to bring about a new type of police service and a new type of policing. But change at any level in any organization is something that is difficult to manage. Have you given consideration to maybe engaging a change management specialist to help bring about the change you want to see? You have the vision, but you have to get the buy-in, and you have to ensure that the vision is clearly communicated at all levels. Sometimes it's difficult for the person at the helm who is deeply rooted in the organization to manage that change process. Have you given consideration to? Yes, I have. And actually we did make representation for it at the draft estimates. So as we, so, I, so as we develop our 
operating plan for 2024. We will discuss further and identify a firm to assist us. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. That's comforting to hear. And one of the changes that you wanted to implement, and you announced that in March last year, was um, a mandate for every station to host monthly town hall meetings, um, community meetings, town hall meetings. Did you get the buy-in from all of your officers, from all of your stations? Are town hall meetings being hosted monthly? Um, but can you tell me how many meetings have happened but since you made that announcement around March to now? And um, some of the communities that would have been engaged. Thanks. Again, member, would it be acceptable for me to provide that information for you subsequently, please? Yes, but can you tell me if, if you're aware if every station to date would have um, at least tried to implement the town hall or the community meetings? I will say most. I will say most. Yes. And how do you monitor to ensure that um, if they haven't implemented as yet, that they're actually giving consideration. Is there any active monitoring? Who is responsible for ensuring that that instruction is being carried out? Okay, we have our monitoring and evaluation unit that keeps track of it. Additionally, the divisional commanders are responsible for ensuring all policy directives are followed. Um, Member Munina would have mentioned um, the incident where the response for the body that was in the home, I think it was an elderly gentleman. Do you have a, um, as it would, do you have within your standard operating procedures clear guidelines in terms of what it is, what the response time should be? If a call comes in for X, Y, Z, this is the standard time that an officer should respond. Do you have that established within the service? Yes, yes, we do. We have actually, we are seeking to have a response time of 11 minutes. You are seeking to have a response time of 11 minutes as standard for what type of calls? Or is it at 11 minutes across the board? Yes, 11 minutes across the board. Madam Commissioner, given your past experiences, do you think that is a realistic time frame to put out there for the public to, for the public to, <laughs> to accept. We were able, from the calls recorded over the past 2021, 2020, 2022 recorded, we have a response time of about 12, 12 minutes. That is as recorded, I believe, about 12, 12 to 13 minutes. So, um, well, that is, as I said, of what we have recorded. Recorded 19 hours, would they? Yeah. Those, so those calls would mostly be the calls that go to the E999 response. So when you call 999, those are the calls we would really track. Is that response you're talking about answering the phone or sending an officer to respond to the complaint? So just for clarity. Sending an officer to respond. Go on, Member Webster, right? So, Madam Commissioner, as it is now in Trinidad and Tobago, the average response time for sending an officer is 12 minutes? As far as... As far as was reported based on our tracking. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. But just, I just want to, to remind members that those reports are reports that went to the E999 Command Center. No, no, not, not the police station. We want you to give us the police, the police station. station that's, yeah. Madam Commissioner, there's an issue, part of the direct inquiry that we are here about is to ask about strategies that you are to implement to establish approaches to combat the increasing brazenness and open criminality. I, I, we want specifics, if you can. What is being done to arrest that situation of the brazenness of the criminals? Could you tell the public? Because that is a concern for safety, what is being done to arrest that 
upsurge in brazenness in the criminals? Chair, what, as an organization, what we are doing, we are focusing on providing that visibility. In so court. the first thing is visibility. Yes. Right. Go on. We are focusing on retrieving illegal firearms. That, that, that is also laudable because less firearms, less crime being committed with firearms, right? Additionally, we are targeting all, all prolific, all prolific offenders, I would say prolific offenders. So, or some persons would say priority offenders. Okay. Because we have, as we are looking at the power few, so that if we have a population of a hundred, uh, a million, 300, 400, we just have in that just over probably about 300, if so many, persons who are causing the mayhem. So we are focusing our attention on these persons. Madam Commissioner, thank you for that answer. In your, in your quest for the retrieval of the firearms, have you considered a policy of an amnesty on a time? It, it was done in the past, an amnesty for persons with illegal firearms to say, look, bring in your firearms. I don't know if it has worked and it, it was tried before. And Madam Commissioner, I see one of your officers is itching you. You have take, you have... You have answered the question so far. If one of your officers wish to answer, we are willing to receive him. Offering the amnesty is not, is, is not the, does not fall under the authority of the Understood. commissioner. However, I will hand over to. And Officer Mr. Simon, we, we, are, we are crisp with our answers. Let me hear you. Amnesty for firearms. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the question of amnesty, as you know, it's, it's one that permeates the, the criminal justice arena. Uh, and uh, we have noticed, because uh, we, do, do, we do our research within the TTPS, we have noticed that the amnesties do not necessarily tend to, to impact crime in terms of reduction as we would want it to do. In fact, it seems to, to provide an escape route for, for, for persons. When you do check these firearms, you may see them linked to a number of uh, outstanding investigations that the amnesty, now any amnesty will now cause to become negated. So it is not, a, it is not something that the, the TTPS really wish to, to, to go after. And I, and I think I have heard even comments coming out, even from the parliament and other persons, that uh, amnesty is perhaps would not be the best thing. And uh, we support that view. Thank you. Before we go to our next member, Member Sukhayu, there's a question. One, we'll take one question from the public. The question, as I understand it, is you, you've placed an emphasis on training. Is there an audit being done to assess how efficient and how effective the training that is being paid for, of course, is for the police service? For the remedial training, is it being successful and what is the, is it being audited and monitored? Chair, the remedial training, are you speaking of the um, customer service? Well, actually, we have just put that into the remedial because of the incident in St. James, in St. Joseph. So we, we did not have an opportunity before. So I cannot say that it, will, that it is being um, evaluated. But you will, ev you are evaluating it, of course. Yes, yes, we are. Member Sukai. Chair, thank you, and committee. Honorable Madam Commissioner and your esteemed <coughs> colleagues, I want to thank you once more again. You have brought a beautiful smile and a, a, a very elegant and peaceful demeanor to the face of the TTPS. However, I sit here as a member and a son of the soil of Trinidad and Tobago. And when a mother cries in love until, or a business owner is killed senselessly, un well, senselessly in, 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 um, in Chagones, or someone is raped, any part of Trinidad and Tobago, it hits. It really hurts. And 
I've heard over the years that TTPS has always concentrated on improving customer service. So this is nothing new on it, the sun. But he, somehow it falls through the cracks. So whether it's you or commissioners of the past, I have not seen anything come forward to show that TTPS have actually improved. So it is not that you're now improving customer service. Things were there before, am I right in saying that? And then how could you measure, or why does it fall through the crack that you have instances like this? Where is the improvement metrics being brought forward? Do you have that data to present to say, okay, listen, we have improved from X, Y, Z, because we have instances like this all the time. And even if there are young individuals who are now entering the force, shouldn't it, they understand what they're going into? They're to protect and serve the population, not themselves. This is just my first question. We are now embarking on, our, on this customer service policy. And, and that is simply because of what would have been happening through the years. Another aspect of the customer service policy that we're going to implement is other than having all police officers trained in customer service. We're also going to be appointing customer service representative at each, at our major stations in the interim. So that will work towards providing all the feedback to victims of crime, persons who come to the station to make reports. So, as, so we are hoping, not just hoping, but we anticipate that with the complete implementation of this policy, we will see the benefits in the so is this, short. So is this a new policy or is it something that was there before? How is it different from the old policies? In other words, there were policies before in the past on customer service or, this, or no? Because there weren't really um, policies, written policies for customer service prior. All right, thank you. The uh, other point is that, and I'm coming from uh, Member Munilal when he was explaining about vehicles. While TTPS receives a lion's share financially towards the operation, is it that you all are really starved for resources or mismanagement? And my question is twofold. In terms of your vehicles, are they tracked by GPS, and do you have a command center that monitors exactly where these vehicles are at any given time? Yes, our vehicles are tracked, and we, are, we track them at our command centers. We have eight divisions with command centers. So then the command centers will send, a f there's screens, and uh, you don't have to go into details. They will send information back to the attendants who are dealing with like, the telephone attendants or who are dealing with the public to give an uh, exact update as to where the police are. Because for someone to be 17 hours, and I'm just quoting what member Munilal said, right? Couldn't it be? that the command center could look and see which is the closest vehicle or officer on patrol that could have attended to that? Yes, that is possible. Why isn't it done if these are the things that are already there? What is the problem? Is it management issue? Is it that you have to go to each one of the division, understand the org structure, understand which is the wheat case link, and try to bring it together? I'm just trying to get a clearer picture because we seem to be spinning top and mud all the time when it comes to crime, safety, and security in Trinidad and Tobago. It may be a bit of supervision at the division level. Thank you. And, and coming back, um, last year there was um, actually on May 17th, this committee indicated about the audited report conducted on record keeping for licensed firearm dealers, right? 
and uh, that they are keeping with the existing law and following all the criteria. Was this audit complete? And if it was complete, was a report submitted um, to you in terms of these licensed firearm owners? Unfortunately, that audit is still ongoing. It has not been fully completed. Do you have a deadline date as to when a completion could be expected? I don't want to commit to a date. However, we do have a number of action parts involved. So I don't want to commit to a date. So when it comes to FULs, though, are you in the process of looking through the system and issuing FULs right now? Or where is that system um, right now? Because, I mean, there is a general unrest in our country. And I know you have to do it not by a piecemeal way. You do it systematically with proper due diligence. Where is that system? Okay, so I want to advise the committee that in terms of FUL, the licenses, applications are being approved. As I did indicate on my last appearance, the investigations is a bit more robust. However, um, over the last year, I would have issued just over 100 FUL. We have an average of 25,000 applications. 25,000 applications. Yes. What is creating that, 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 um, that bottleneck in then to only filter? Uh, uh, uh. No, just asking, what, what is it? Is it that most of the applicants well, not disqualified? Exactly, or? It's okay. exactly. Not everyone will qualify that because there is a criteria for owning a firearm. Okay, and you have that like broken now into percentage so that you can say, okay, these were the ones that weren't qualified so that you know, the percentage went this way and, and these are the ones that still on the list and you're going through and doing the due diligence? No, I cannot say I have it broken down in percentages. Thank you. Madam, Madam Commissioner, going back to this the ticklish issue of firearm users' applications, are you telling the country you are the, the present incarnation of the Commission of Police in Trinidad and Tobago. Have you stopped issuing firearms? Are you issuing, you are issuing firearms, are you? The persons who apply? Licensing, yes, licensing. licensing firearm. firearm license? Yes, and this is based on the conclusion of a robust investigation. A robust, but are you saying that there were 25,000 persons who applied last year, no. or was that a backlog that you had for applicants before? That includes a backlog. That includes a backlog. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Um, Member Lashmi Dial. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon again, uh, Madam Commissioner and your team. Just to piggyback off the issue before I get to my other questions about the FULs, can you provide us in writing, I assume you may not have that data now, but can you provide us in writing um, with a disaggregation of the 25,000 pending applications, how many year by year, so if we can want to see how long, you can do it perhaps in um, categories within one year, um, two to five years, over five years. How long those applications have been pending? How many applications, you said you granted 100 in the last year, about 100. Um, how many of the, how many applications were actually processed and rejected out of the numbers that you have actually processed? And um, can you tell us whether or not of those 25,000, how many of them are for first-time applicants and how many are for variations? Yeah. So we can get a better idea because 25,000, you know, but it may be that there's some are variations. So I just want to get an idea of how many are first-time applicants and so on. Okay? Yes, right. Um, one of the first questions, um, Part of your statement, your opening statement, you mentioned that getting a little more support from stakeholders 
and you were asked about whether it was stakeholders, you know, just members of the public generally coming forward. And of course, we've been having the conversation about public confidence. Are there other stakeholders, however, that you feel um, could have collaborated more and assisted the TTPS in terms of achieving the targets, albeit very ambitious targets that you set um, that, you know, do you think that you could have gotten support from any other specific stakeholders in terms of um, achieving those targets that you set? Not, not really specific stakeholders, but having the support of the public in terms of providing information with regards to criminal activities would assist. What about collaboration between TTPS and other arms of law enforcement? Um, like um, Member Richards, um, I would have observed during the Christmas period, and I can only speak about where I'm from in San Fernando, but I would have observed a very strong army presence um, in and around the city, the shopping areas of the city during the Christmas period, uh, which I was very happy to see. Um, so I try to highlight the good as well. But do you feel that you're getting sufficient support and is there room for further collaboration that can assist CTPS in achieving its targets if you have more collaboration with other arms of law enforcement? Yes, and we do continue to have that collaboration between the TTPS and the TTDF. We also have the municipal police officers working alongside us, the transit police officers also. When last we spoke, and in our previous inquiry, there was a lot of concern raised, especially when it comes to illegal firearms, about the role being played by customs in terms of allowing the entry of illegal firearms into the country because, um, and I'm paraphrasing of course, but it was stated both from um, persons appearing before the committee and I think we felt the same way, that when the problem lands on our shores, literally, then it becomes TTPS problem when the firearm is on the streets, but we can arrest the problem perhaps at the port. <laughs> Have you had any improved um, feedback? Are you seeing a little more collaboration in terms of joint exercises and so on with customs? There was an issue came up last year about illegal firearms um, disappearing or what we believe to be illegal firearms disappearing from a private bonded warehouse somewhere, I think in Piaco. Um, or something along those lines that caused delay in terms of, pro when people were quarreling about the Christmas packages being delayed, the Minister of Finance made the comment about the fact that customs is now experiencing, um, they had to do more in terms of those bonded warehouses because they believe what was illegal firearms had actually made its way out and stolen from one of these warehouses. So the issue of the firearms, apart from them getting into the hands of the criminals on the street, them actually entering the country, seems to still be a very serious issue that would affect, obviously, your um, ability to meet your targets. Have you seen any improvements, and what can you, what would you like to see going forward to assist you in meeting your targets in terms of collaboration or an improvement in the way things are done between the TTPS and Customs and managing the legal ports of entry in Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, thank you so very much. And it's it gives me pleasure to even report and advise that there has been an increase and a better um, collaboration between the TTPS and the Customs Department. At our level, I would have had discussions with the Comptroller of Customs. So we have joint operations going on at the port. Additionally, the the bond that you're referring to, I believe it is Midway, that is at Freeport, where there are several occasions when firearms were recovered at that bond. Right. Um, and again, if I know you may not have it off the top of your head, but um, if you can tell us um, exactly, like let's say during 2023, how many joint exercises were conducted with customs um, at ports and which, well, you don't, well, yes, we provide privately to us which ports those were conducted at. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, when we deal with other arms of law enforcement, one of the things that came up on the last time, and again, we had differences 
of opinions and information coming from the different bodies that appeared before us. But the issue of marked ammunition appearing on crime scenes and being found on crime scenes, the TCDF came before us and said that they had completed an audit. And it was almost complete, but that all of their ammunition had been accounted for. We continue from time to time seeing newspaper reports stating that on the scene of various murders, shootings, woundings, etc., that um, um, bullets marked TTDF, I think one time there was the air guard um, and others, those marked ammunition being found on those scenes. Has the TTPS conducted um, an investigation into this matter? Have you all arrived at, um, you know, collaborated with the TTDF? Because yeah, at the time, at the time um, when TTDF appeared before us, they were told that they had not yet, we were told that they had not yet been contacted by the TTPS to collaborate in terms of an investigation into those matters. Because at that point in time, we had, I think we had presented here about five or six newspaper reports to them of instances of those marked, um, that marked ammunition. So have you made any headway with those investigations? Chair, can I defer to Mr. Simon, please? Certainly, Madam Commissioner. Certainly, Chair and a member, that has been a concern of the TTPS. And uh, I, in fact, uh, initiated meetings uh, with, with different uh, heads at the TTD, TTDF. And uh, the discussions uh, even allowed us to, to guide uh, perhaps the approaches to, to investigations into things of this, this nature. Uh, one of the things that came out was the possibility of a person's uh, rebuilding, rebuilding ammunition and we, I think that was spoken of here and uh, we went into that we went we use our cyber crime uh, personnel to, to, to assist us with that because some of the, the 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 instruments may have to be brought in and we know people can order them they, are, they can be easily ordered on Amazon and so on so that is what we found out in our investigation so to date we have not identified or located anyone bringing them in and using that doesn't mean that it isn't happening and uh, perhaps that is our, the best plausible uh, look we can take at, at the, perhaps the, the presence of the TTDF and TT, 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 yeah, TTP, TT, TTPS and every other, any other uh, agency within law enforcement that their markings being found on, on these uh, items at crime scenes. As we know that all of, the, all of law enforcement would, would go and would have their practice sessions on the Wrong. So we have uh, done certain things with regards to the disposal of uh, the used ammunition on, in these areas. And uh, the, whilst you are still seeing uh, the, the incidence of, of these things popping up, the incidents are indeed reducing, and, uh, but we have not been able to, to find a culprit as it relates to, to this, we to the, the TTPS, we have done an inventory with our ammunition and our ammunition are to uh, are accounted for. And uh, so the, it's the, we are depending on the investigation. It has not halted to, to perhaps you know, bring any other light into the situation. When we had the um, Forensic Sciences Center um, be appear before us, I think that matter came up of the spent shells being rebuilt and so I'm happy to hear that you all are uh, improving your processes at the, the range or wherever it is that practice sessions are held. Um, my information, I don't know much about it, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but my information is those spent shells sell for a lot of money because they are copper or whatever it is, and that it's um, a, lucrative, a lucrative business. Um, so that perhaps the security measures at the range where, t where all arms of law enforcement would be um, having their practice sessions is something to be looked at. Um, final question for this round. On the last occasion as well, um, Madam Commissioner, I think you said that there might have been a bit of a lapse in terms of checking on not just ammunition or thing ammunition, but also uniforms and so on. Um, I think it is in the standing orders you referred to that it's necessary to have persons to present their kits for inspection and all of that. Have you taken steps to ensure? Because one of the things in your a very detailed um, violent crime reduction plan that I, I looked through a PowerPoint presentation. You talked about better management and accountability within the TTPS. So apart from customer service and all of that, the use of TTPS equipment and you know, its 
not being abused in terms of being used to commit criminal activity, I think is something that's a big concern for the public. Have you implemented and enforced, and are you monitoring the, whether it is the um, divisional commanders, um, you know, station officers in charge of each station and so on, if they are um, required to do these audits and ask officers to present their kits for inspection, have, has that um, in your, has that taken place? And um, what else do you think can be done to reduce the incidence of not just uniforms and ammunition, but any sort of police um, issued equipment being used or abused in terms of um, getting its way into the hands of scrupulous individuals? Yes, we have implemented and we continue to have officers do their kit inspections with regards to other equipment. It's about ensuring that we have our proper, that we adhere to our management procedures, which we do have. And again, are you receiving regular reports and are you monitoring? Because you yourself cannot physically you know, check everything and everybody's kit. But are you ensuring, or do you have, or is the monitoring evaluation units, as you spoke about earlier, are they actually ensuring that the persons who are responsible for doing this, are, that it's being carried out? The divisional commanders are to ensure that the kit inspections are carried out, and a return is to be sent to the deputy commissioner of operations. Ma Madam Commissioner, I going back to our fundamentals this afternoon to understand your strategies to address criminality in Trinidad and Tobago. As Member Richards said when we started this meeting, this is a very important time for Trinidad and Tobago and our presenting ourselves to the world. What are your short-term plans? relative to being proactive for combating crime. I can tell you as a member of Parliament for Port of Spain South, when a crime occurs on the, the avenue in particular, businesses suffer because people are afraid to come out to go to certain establishments late in the night, etc., and we lose revenue. What, what can you tell the country are your short-term plans in order to combat crime and to be proactive in this season? Well, as we are particularly in this season, this carnival season, what we have done and what we, we try to ensure that we have that active visibility on our roadways. We have particularly the known areas, the avenues, the Arapita Avenue, all the areas where we know activities take place. We ensure we have police presence, not um, particularly during the, the times. So what I, so I can assure the public that we will continue, we'll continue to provide that, not just the visibility, but the active visibility. And what about outside of Carnival? Because I actually, for the short term, what, what else? I, we have looked at your plan presented last year. We have looked at, the, you have visibility in improving the quality of police responses. What, what, uh, what else can you tell the, the, the population? We, we have viewed your plan. We have it here. We've looked at your targets, your outlook for critical success, etc. Apart from visibility, well, I want to assure the public that the TTPS is just committed, committed to providing that safety and security that the citizens require and deserve, that we are committed and we will continue to do all that is necessary to assure the public. It's not just provide the safety, but even that sense of safety, that sense of security. Member Richards. Thank you, um, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, I want to go back to the issue of, and following the Chairman's question. Uh, and it has to do with the public trust and confidence issue. And, and several of the, the conversations of my colleagues with you uh, and your team really lead back to that. And because you yourself mentioned at the start in your opening presentation 
that you didn't feel a lot of stakeholders were participating as fervently as they should. And that is specifically because of a lack of public trust and confidence. The data supports that. And public trust and confidence is internal in the police service, as well as external stakeholders. I want to touch a bit on the issue, and, and, one, and this first issue I want to touch on has to do with the recent promotions issue. Uh, you smile. And because it has to do, and, and, and there was a, a press conference uh, hosted by Mr. Uh, A.S.B. Dixon, who is the head of the Police Social and Welfare Association, which spoke to concerns about the promotions issue. And I'm presuming promotions should not be an, an unusual activity in a, an organization like the police service. Uh, there were several bits of information coming out in the media that there was a glitch. I don't know what that means. Uh, there were bits of information that I can't verify as accurate that persons, a certain number of persons wrote the exam or the exams and there are a certain number, a cadre of positions to be filled by promotion. And persons who may have not scored as high ended up in the promotions list and it caused, it caused quite a bit of disease and reduced morality among officers in the rank and file of the police service. What happened or what didn't happen? with that promotions issue. What was the cause of the controversy or the issues? Chair, what I would, what I would say, you know, that promotion exercise was supposed to be one to build the morale of the ground crew because most of the officers would have qualified past their exams and have become eligible for promotion since 2008. And so instead of it achieving that goal, we had an issue. In terms of what really happened, I will defer to the DCP administration, who was the chair of the promotion advisory board. Right, so good evening, everyone. <clears throat> that task of interviewing 2,232 persons was a mammoth task that involved several different units providing valuable information to the consultant for the generation of a merit list. When the promotion was made, promotion was made on the 29th, the month, which was a Friday, we got a call the Monday and because of that call, we decided to review all the sections that submitted the required points. What the call? The call queried, um, I don't want to go too much into it because it could be sub judice. Some of the matters are before the court. But it, it really, really queried um, the marks and why they weren't promoted. And when we reviewed, we realized that something was amiss. And because of that, we had to fix it. And we appointed a team. And that team reviewed all the different sections that were supposed to have submitted the marks. And uh, at the end of the investigation, there was a conclusion that, in fact, all the marks went to the auditors. And something to do with the Excel sheet, where at the end of the day, the amount of persons who were interviewed was about the context into what really happened, is that some persons when they were rostered for interview, didn't show up on the day. And 
They may have done that twice, three times, but the auditors didn't know. And when the sheet went across to the auditors, the names appeared on the master list three and four times. So when they double checked, they realized that 2,232 persons were interviewed, but they were getting more than that. And they went ahead and they take off the names of the persons who appeared twice and three times, but the correct names. And when they did that, apparently there was some shifting of the cells on the Excel sheet. And some marks that were supposed to go to a person went to another person. Before the courts? Yes. If it is going to be before the courts. So I don't want courts, to go further on that, yes. It's not going to go before the courts? Yes. Yeah, well, a lot of if, if a pre-action was sent, mm -hmm. I, I would prefer that we err on the side that you err on the side of caution. I do not undertake to be your attorney, but I prefer I would want you to consider it. Right, at, a, at that stage, a, a numeric, it was fixed, it went to the consultant and the generator and numericless. Right. I'm trying to be careful here, based on the chairman's guidance. And this is a live broadcast. And you can understand, and I'm talking about public trust and confidence in the police service here. Why should the public not question the competence of a police service to do what is an ordinary operation in HR and IR services in any organization in the country where tabulating marks and having a digital process goes so awry? That, that to me, this is cause for grave concern. Grave, grave concern. Because it brings into question the officer's confidence in the leadership to do this properly. And it brings into question the public's confidence in the service's competence. And you would understand why. Because this is a straightforward HR process in any organization. And to add to that, it would not have been the first promotion exercise done by the police service, yes? Um, what I could say is that once we identify the issues, it was fixed. Right. Member Munila? Can, can, can I? Go, sure. Go, sure. Well, I wrong by maybe asking the question that Senator Richards wants to ask. When you say that's been fixed, what, what does fix mean? It, uh, what, what, is, what is the consequent now and what, uh, what has happened? When I say it was fixed, the persons who should have been promoted and, and were left out in the first instance, they were promoted. And what about the persons who were promoted and should not have been promoted? Uh, Did you take back the stripe or something like that? That's an that's a, that's a issue where legal advice is being sought. Okay, I'll move on. Can I move on, Chairman? Yo, we have another. Go ahead, sure. Member Munilal, go on. Yes. We, have, we have one um, question in this round. Yes, yes go ahead, Member Munilal. No, no, make, no. it, make it count. Um, <laughs> well, I may have a double barrel question. <laughs> make it count. Um, uh, the Commissioner, this matter of vetted units in the TTPS, what do we understand vetted units to be? I've taken note that the, um, that the head of the National Security Council and Prime Minister has, has spoken in the public about the introduction of vetted units in the TTPS. What do you understand this to mean? And if I'm not mistaken, the current trip by those dealing with security and so on in Washington is also related to strengthening policing and security in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, just to understand what is that, because it, uh, it assumes that this matter deals with another critical pillar. We have been talking about public confidence and so on but the issue of corruption in the police service, which has remained endemic for some time. Um, and, and to what extent uh, are you meeting and treating with allegations and reality of corrupt officers, as few as they may be, um, and that matter of vetted, uh, vetted units in the Trinidad and Tobago uh, police service, the related matter as well, um, the increasing use 
and this is related, of course, to corruption and, uh, as well, the increasing occurrence or incidence of criminal elements uh, appearing in what uh, considered to be uh, uniforms and so on, looking like police, uh, and not only that, but apparently using vehicles that may have unauthorized lights, blue lights and siren and heavily tinted and so on, that appears to anyone as a security vehicle, as a police vehicle and so on. And that may be used by criminal elements in the commission of, of crimes. And, and uh, I wanted to find out, you know, what, is this receiving the attention of the TTPS with any increased focus, that fake police crisis that we face? Because in my constituency, quite recently, legitimate police officers went to the door of a person's home to conduct an inquiry, to ask for assistance in a matter, and the resident refused to open the gate. Uh, and, this, and the police officers, who we have all reason to believe are uh, authentic and real police, had their, their ID cards and everything, and the, the residents uh, refused to open the gate. And now the police did not have a warrant, they were conducting an inquiry and needing some assistance. But this, cri this crisis, I, I believe, is something that um, I'd like to hear you address. We are, we are concerned and we have taken note of the issue. And that is one of the reasons and one of the, the avenues which we seek to manage and put some control is to request that police officers wear their official police uniform which is a gray and blue, with their identification badges, and to desist, to appoint as necessary, the use of the operational wear. The operational wear is available at some of our stores. What we need to do, and that will be at public government level, to put sanctions in place, to control the sale of these items. Madam Commissioner, I am certain that operational wear is outlawed. I am certain you cannot have camouflage and you cannot have the wear of the protective services unless authorized. So you don't need any intervention. You do not need any intervention charge. If, if, madam, if, if, if there's a challenge, that's why you have a judge and a magistrate. But one, because if it is, and I just want to say to you, if that's the mischief that member, you understood what member Munilal is saying to you, that the legitimate police went to the legitimate home, but the persons thought that the legitimate police were illegitimate because of the prevalence of illegitimate persons engaging in camouflage or not legitimate police gear. Charge. Go to the stores. Charge. That's why they have a magistrate and they have a judge. Let the magistrate and the judge decide. But the law is there and the law is there to be implemented. You will not be judge and jury. You are the prosecutor. The next question was the vetted, the vetted, the, the vetted arm. Um. Vetted units, member are units where officers are specifically selected and would go through a process of background checks and um, polygraphs. So they will be properly selected and screened. So we have a number of these units. And yes, we go through that so that we can feel confident that these officers attached to these units are uh, above reproach. Yes, we have a number of vetted units. Chair, if I could piggyback off of that response. Commissioner, you know, I, as a civilian, who I might be a little bit more familiar than the average civilian with law enforcement, but just as a regular civilian, when I listen to that response, I'm concerned that that level of vetting you speak about isn't being done for the entire police service. 
Because the thing that we have to handpick or cherry pick certain officers who are above reproach and who are special in some respect and who are properly vetted um, leaves one to imagine that the rest of the officers who we have to interact with every day showing up at our gates and so on may not be above reproach and aren't being properly vetted. And I think this goes back to the issue of the lack of, you have identified public trust and confidence as a significant pillar of, your, of the success that you wish to achieve. And if it is that you have to say that I need to handpick specialized vetted units with police who are above reproach and do a certain level of vetting on them to ensure that they can perform certain functions, then doesn't that undermine confidence in the rest of the police service? Because people may be looking at the rest of the police and they see that one, he couldn't make it into the specialized unit, you know, because he, he, he ain't above reproach. So that's one question that I, I, I mean, I understand in all um, police organizations around the world, you have like um, internal affairs and so on, that all of us watch law and order, right? So we know what, what, what they are supposed to do, what they are supposed to investigate police and so on. But I think a little more, uh, so perhaps that level of detail or what exactly you mean by specially vetted, um, we need to understand. Secondly, uh, do you have any plans to improve the background checks and vetting of the average constable patrolling high streets in San Fernando because, again, that's the first thing that jumped into my mind when I heard about special vetting and people above reproach for these specialized units. What about the officer that stopping me by the traffic light and asking me for my license and registration? I, as a woman driving in the night, I'm very happy that I have a sticker on my car that says MP on it because I don't want to be stopped by a police officer at night sometimes because I am afraid of what I may encounter. And I say that with the greatest of respect to all of you because I know you are all very hardworking officers, but the level of confidence that people feel and the level of safety and security you feel because you don't know if the person you're encountering is above reproach. You don't even know if it's a real police officer. There was a kidnapping of a young businesswoman that took place, um, you know, persons who portrayed themselves as police officers. So, and we don't up to now know whether or not there was some, you know, collaboration or participation of persons in law enforcement. So, we need some more information about this vetting and what type of vetting, or are you going to improve the vetting of regular officers as well, apart from these specialized units? And I think, going on. sorry, <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, I, I think that that's something that we need to clarify for members of the public. Um, Madam Commissioner, I want to fortify you in the advice that I've given to you just now. I would ask you to consult with your legal team, Section 62 of the Police Service Act, which reads as follows. A person other than a police officer who without the written authority of the Commissioner of Police, the written authority of the Commissioner of Police puts on or assumes either in whole or in part the uniform, name, designation, or description of a police officer or a uniform, name, or designation resembling and intended to resemble the uniform, name, or designation of a police officer or in any way pretends to be a police officer for the purpose which he would not by law be entitled to do with his own authority is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $30,000 or to imprisonment for three years. My first thought of this is that this penalty ought to be augmented. That is a question for the parliament. But for now, you have your legislation in place, which gives you the power to charge. So the first thing you ought to do, once you know of these stores, wherever they may be, that are selling these items, go to them armed with your legislation and your team and be robust in the prosecution. Madam Webster Roy. Madam, you want to answer the question by the last question by Member Lutch Media and of course the issue I've just raised with you. Member, may I advise that we have background and polygraph done and polygraph done too 
applicants, recruits, so recruits who go into the academy, they would have gone through a thorough background check and su su be successful in our polygraph testing. With regards to special. Compromised, and, um, if you are compromised. And, and, and that is why we have the Professional Standards Bureau and the Complaints Division. These two units are responsible for investigating any allegations or suspicion of police officers. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, after recruiting, at no time would an officer have to go through routine or unannounced drug testing or polygraph testing. That doesn't happen. I want to understand. So that's, that's, so that's what. So that's what. So that is what we're trying to implement now. Yes. Okay. That is thank God for that because <laughs> I'm saying that based on my experience with a specific agency that I work with, where we saw the need to have that continuous testing of persons who would have come in with a so-called clean seat, right? Having said that, for the past 10 years, I want you to detail how many police officers are on record of having been convicted or serving or having served time for any offenses committed. If you have the information available for the past 10 years. Yes, I will commit to give that information. Also, um, if you could provide information in terms of the number of officers you currently have on suspension and, you, and that, what is that costing you, costing the police service? So you're on suspension, but you're still being paid. What is that costing the police service? Yes, I will commit to supply that information in writing. Uh, one other question. What plans you have in place to help to address the issue of corruption within the police service. What, what we have done, ensure that we have a well-staffed professional standards bureau. We are in the process of recruiting additional staff in for the professional standards bureau, and this is the unit that is responsible for investigating corrupt allegations against police officers. Side of the Professional Standards Bureau staffing that unit, what else would you consider that you can do as the head of the service to ensure that there's greater, a greater level of integrity within the service? But what we kept, yeah. yes, that, yes, we actually did at the recruit level implemented um, ethics training so that we are hoping that from inception you are guided along that line. Additionally, we continue, we continue to in providing training along that line, holding and we hold officers accountable. So what we would want, what I would want any member of the public who has information of any corrupt practices of police officers to bring it to the attention of the commissioner of the, any police officer actually you should, but if you feel more comfortable, the head of the professional standards bureau. Um, commissioner. Member Sukai. Thank you, Chair. Madam Commissioner, we know that technology is one of the key um, elements that you, you could use to help combat crime, right? Um, I know that, or I take note that TTPS had their own app. Is that app functional? I'm not too sure which app you speak about. Well, I went to the app store just now. I downloaded an app that says TTPS. There's only one app. 
Uh, and when you go on to it and say, sorry, the app is not available anymore. So I want to know whatever became of it. And, and there's a reason why I'm saying this, because one of the concerns that we have when we're doing due diligence for officers, um, a lot of times we see the general public will just have their badge number, right? But we don't know whether or not is if it's fake or how to do diligence, do due diligence for ourselves. But if the app has the ability to scan, I'm, I'm pretty sure like how in most companies you have a card, right, an uh, uh, ID card, basically, and I believe TTFPS will have such cards with them, that if a member of the public does decide to do their own due diligence on an officer, whoever it may be, they could actually scan that as a barcode and pull up on their phone a bit of background on this information, on this individual, whether or not they are real or they are actually imposing or Im impersonating to be a police officer. Another thing is that when you're talking about complaints, what we could do, the, and using technology, the individuals who pull up could actually then file a report on that app or rate your, your, your officer, whether he or she, what level of service. And doing that now, you're using technology, right, instead of just reporting directly to the commissioner. Right, and then you actually start building a database and a background of these individuals, and that's live data. This is something I believe we should look forward to and implement. This is a, a suggestion on my behalf. Also, I'd like to find out what's going on with the air patrol for TTPS. Is it operational, TTPS air patrol? So. Shall I answer your, first, your last question first? And yes, our air support unit is operational. And I would like to add at this time that we are in the process of launching our 10 new drones to provide support. Air support. Right, there's, there's the air, air support, support with unit. drones, but I'm talking about like a helicopter in terms of helicopters. And I ask this. Seeing that there was a case recently where the woman fell off the cliff in San Fernando, and what sort of I'm, I'm, I'm not I don't have the details about it, but the rescue effort I believe would have been made easier if it was from air, and that's why I'm just asking, you know, Lehman Sim, does the TTPS currently have? air support when it comes to maybe a TTPS helicopter. I knew they had it in the past. I just would like to know, is that functional? Or is there a new arrangement with a separate agency? We have access to helicopters, which our air support unit would utilize when they go particularly in search of lost persons, hikers. However, the response unit, and the incident in San Fernando was actually the fire services. And then coming back to the first question, in terms of that suggestion. That is a great suggestion, and that is something that we definitely will look into implementing. And my last question to you, and Chair, if you forgive me, HR, do you think it's time that we look to outsource the HR and um, human resource, uh, sorry, the human resource and customer service side to TTPS by having an independent agency handle this? Because of nepotism and favoritism, maybe within the system that will prevent such things, you want some an independent body to start looking forward. Do you think it may be a good suggestion? Just ask. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I understand your suggestion. When it comes to issues in terms of promotion, looking at HR, looking at, 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 at the qualifications, do you think it's time that we have an independent view on that or independent agency look at that? Uh, and then again, even the Service Commission has their flaws. Regulation do cater for an independent consultant. And an independent consultant, normally an agency, is employed. And you take their suggestions in some cases? They are responsible for supplying the merit list for promotion. Thank you. Yes. Member Murilal, you have yes. been jumping in the chops and, yes, and, and um, you have. Chairman. You, 
We hold you. You have Member Richards telling me. Go ahead, Member Mulila. Member Richards, Chairman, you go thank after. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Just two quick questions, really. Um, one, uh, Commissioner, getting back to an earlier issue I raised, would you be in support of the introduction of a system, as they do, as you know, in North America and elsewhere and so on, of recording conversations, recording calls to and from police stations and members of the public to ensure that standards are met, to ensure that you can see areas for improvement vis-a-vis -vis customer and client uh, service and so on. Would you be in support of that? And my second question, which I can tell you, one time I would, you know, I would not let you go without asking this question about the mobile scanners. Um, the taxpayer did invest a significant amount of money in them. We were told on one occasion it was a question of training persons to use it. Then we were told again it was a question of some equipment needed fixing. Um, and so I just wanted to get an update as of this time, what um, would be the issue now with the mobile scanners, which we actually saw TTPS uh, you know, exhibit in a short video once they were using it uh, along the highways and so on. So if there's some update on that, we'll appreciate it. Thank you for the question again, Chair. And of course, uh, the mobile scanners, they did find themselves in this arena in our discussions. Um, the contract with the, the company uh, came, came to an end with those mobile scanners. But before they came to an end, we made sure that we have a, a proper understanding of what it is that the equipment was really able to do. So there was, uh, we had selected a day, an entire day that we used to, to see theoretically what it can do. And we were given a demonstration of it on video. And then we did a real live video, a real live, sorry, scenario of the equipment. Uh, we in the TTPS, the executive that is, we were not particularly impressed with what it is the, the mobile scanners were, were able to do in terms of detection of, of, um, of, of, of firearms and, and so on, we were not particularly impressed. So that, those results from, from, from that engagement cause us not to renew the, that, that contract. I hope that answers the question. Uh, Consultation. You will dispose of it. Members, um, Commissioner, you have to keep your answers a little shorter because we are looking to end at 4.30. We may go into overtime. So answer the next question. And Member Sukai must go to Member Paul Richards after. Thank you. It's your discipline, I am the chairman. But hold on, there's, there's the, first, the first aspect of the question about taping conversations, etc. What is your answer to that, madam? As it relates to solving of crime, remember we are coming back here, anti-crime measures. Go on. I have no objections whatsoever. That will show, show transparency in the operations of the police. And in other words, and that, would that be then a helpful tool in the arsenal to combat crime? Yes, it will. Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I will be very brief, and three, three very brief questions since I've realized that others have overstepped the one question limit. I, I, I aim for equity. First question, it's, it's, again, it has to do with public trust and confidence commission and team. Uh, and you mentioned you, you are, it is important to get public buy-in and public participation. You just mentioned that uh, you, quest, you, you ask for the public to report crimes to the police or, 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 or issues to the police that they think can help police bring perpetrators to justice. Is, and, and one of the issues that has constantly arisen in addition to the, the performance of officers in the public is the, office of, the issue of officers who are in the service who are supplying information to criminals, which by the, the, the strict def definition of, a, of the gang act, anti-gang act, if you are working with a, a criminal element to commit a crime, you may be considered a gang member. Do you think there has been enough emphasis on weeding out those officers, identifying them, and what is the process if an officer is suspected of participating in that type of activity and under investigation? Are they continued to operate in the same way? Are they suspended without prejudice? What is the process? But the public needs to feel confident and comfortable to bring information to the service, that they, they, that they wouldn't get a call tomorrow and hear, well, I hear you call the police, you know, I'll come in for you. Because we've heard those reports in the public domain. If an officer is so identified, he 
he will be treated just like the criminals are treated. Identified does not necessarily mean having the evidence to take him out of the of operation and or bring him to justice. Can you clarify that for me? Because there's, there's a difference between, as the police have always said, intelligence and evidence. So what is the process? So if an officer has been identified to be involved in corrupt practices or aiding and abetting, an investigation will be launched. If the officer in, the, in, the, in that period, does he remain in the service? That's it. In some instances, yes. In some instances, they will be placed on suspension. Okay. Second part of that question related, and, and it has to do with Member Sukai's and, and, and I think Member Dutch Media's comment about technology. And in your, on your last visit to us here, you mentioned there is, when asked, there is a policy regarding the use of body cams, uh, particularly on operations that are planned, particularly in high stakes situations where very often we've seen a huge disparity in the narrative coming out of the officers who were executing the operation and the general public who were there. Recently, I saw an operation being carried out. Several videos came out uh, in the, is it the John John area? just past the flyover coming into Port of Spain, where officers were clearly on an operation there. And I got about 15 videos, because you know these things share very widely. And I looked with great interest at the officers carrying out that operation, which was clearly a planned operation. And I did not see one body cam. Could you explain that? And what is the, because to me, a body cam is such a critical tool. One, to establish an evidential trail as to what happened, how officers conducted themselves, and two, to dissuade the public perception in some instances. And, and some of the persons who are creating narrative have a special interest to create a particular narrative. I understand that. But to identify what is the truth of what happened beyond a reasonable doubt, if that is the phrase. But I'm not seeing it always there in those operations. And that is of concern to me, to me. given your stated policy over and over that body cams are part and parcel of all operations. That is not what I'm seeing. But again, that would be a clear case of officers not following the instructions. And, the and what happens? Because over and over we keep hearing, and, and, and to me, that's a frustrating thing for me to hear. Because I know I have seen in several situations, it is not happening consistently. And I don't know that the TTPS leadership is doing enough to ensure that it's happening. And it's not to trap audiences, actually very often to exonerate on, um, officers who may be accused of overstepping use of force policy, etc. But it is not happening consistently. I can tell you from the, the, the videos I'm seeing. Your comments are noted, member. Madam Commissioner, may I just suggest, if the body cams are provided to these officers in these exercises and they're not doing it, institute disciplinary action against them. Make an example and people will fall into line. Remember, Richard, your last question? Uh, Chairman, with the greatest of respect, I think for you to have to tell the Commissioner to do that is very surprising. I would imagine if it is policy and policy should be followed or some corrective measures should be taken. Just Final, a word to the I, I appreciate that. Third question. Fi Final question. And this is a really off-topic off question, but related. Is there a particular mandate for Beyond the Tape? Is there a particular mandate for the Beyond the Tape show? And I ask the question in context that very often I hear utterances in that show that are in stark contradiction to what the police leadership is saying. And it, and it is very surprising to me. So the police leadership says one thing, about um, gangs, the show is saying, we're giving the gangs a blight. So I'm confirmed, is it there a mandate for that show? And does the show take instruction and policy and, and public dissemination from the police leadership? Because very often, I have heard contradictory information from the police leadership and from what I see on that show. And I don't know which one to believe. The show should, should be a replica of the thoughts and sentiments of the executive of the organization. Is that happening?
there may be at times when the presenter is a bit ad adverse to the, the thoughts of the organization. The presenter representing the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service on a national broadcast, very popular show, in uniform, and you are telling us he, he is averse to what the leadership is saying? That is a well, shocking revelation. I'm, I'm making my comments based on what you would have said. So no one so is monitoring the show from leadership perspective? Yes, the, the show is monitored by the Corporate Communications Unit. Are you satisfied with what is coming out of the show? As, as the police head of the police service? At this time, no. You're not satisfied? And it continues? It has been. No, actually, the show is being reviewed. Okay, thank you. Had this no, no further questions. Madam Commissioner, as we look to wrap up this, there's an issue that arose from members about the confidence in the police and the ongoing checks relative to the integrity of your members, yes? Member Munilal, Member Lachmidial raised it, but you know that as, as we speak, the... Member Munilal, the last words you said to me in Parliament was that you were saying the time is now. I think the time is now to pass that bill because in Parliament being debated now is the miscellaneous provision testing and identification, which is the polygraph bill, the biometric bill, and the, the debate is... Yes, the debate was adjourned and will resume shortly. Would you be in support of measures that will allow the, you and the police the hierarchy, and including yourself, to test and be tested, polygraph, biometric, drugs, etc. Yes, I will submit myself, and I believe my executive officers will also. And finally, this committee wants to, because we, we go back to the nature of our inquiry, and we would want to ask you what approaches are coming from the police service to combat the increasing incidence of school violence and violence in schools involving the young minds and young persons of Trinidad and Tobago. What is being done by the police service in regard and with respect to that? Our community policing unit has taken an active, an active role in monitoring the activities of school children. We have implemented a number of, we have targeted the, for want of a better word, the hot, hot, the hot schools where we have persons Who, are, who have been officers who have been identified to provide support to the school's leadership in terms of lectures and guidance. We have also created, in some instances, police youth clubs within the schools, all with an effort to manage the violence. Commissioner, there, there can be two approaches. There can be the, the soft approach, which is, what about going into the schools? If the police, and if you look back sometimes, your police commissioners who would go into this, have their representative go into the schools, have a word with these, try to reach them. That's the soft approach. The other approach, of course, is, and if it's an offense, we know where that goes. But w what is being done proactively by the police service? Because if we are able to nip that in the bud there, downstream you will have less work to do. What is being done about the youth violence? But that is, exactly is there a unit in the police service that is, is designated to that? Or do you, don't you think the time has come now to have a unit in the police service, particularly geared towards youth and violence and youth? Chair, that is exactly what I would have indicated a while ago. We do have officers going into the schools. Don't you think now it's time to have a unit, a unit in the police dedicated to addressing the minds of, and, and the actions of these persons? 
that is being conducted by the community policing unit. And what about detection? Your detection rate remains, I, I prefer you set those targets and keep achieving it and not lower the bar. What do you plan to do to increase your detection rate? Chair, earlier I would have indicated that we, we have sought to implement, to develop specific training programs geared at homicide investigations. We have embarked on, we have embarked on training our crime scene investigators, all with an attempt to increase our detection rate. About your case management system, is there a system of case management in the police service now that will streamline and would monitor how cases progress and ensure that there is a sort of urgency and efficiency in the dealing with that? Yes, there, yes, there are case management units within each of the divisions and some of the specialist units. Madam Commissioner, we're going into overtime. One question per round, Member Richards. We're going into overtime, but we are glad that you're here. Member Richards, you have one question, not part A and B. One question we're going around. Member Munilal, you go after. Member Richards. Very, thank you, Chairman. Very simple. What can the public expect in the next six months in terms of strategies from the TTPS that make them feel safer? Medium term strategies. the public can expect, as I indicated before, to see more engagement of the police, more visibility. We would have additional, we continue to have our joint operations with the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. And we would again appreciate the communications from the police, from the civilians, from the public on any information that they have that can assist in the detection of crime. Madam Commissioner, just one matter I uh, um, forgot to raise earlier. Was there a concern, a COVID concern recently at the police barracks or at any other uh, facility of the TTPS? Yes, I was informed that there was a COVID outbreak. <coughs> we, we have, in fact, 161 recruits in training. At one point in time, there were 52 cases. As of yesterday, the 161 persons were tested, and we have six active cases. There were 50 cases, you said? Yes, my information is that we had 52 cases. Member Webster Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one question, but I will try to answer some each person. One question. As leaders within the service in your own right, each of you would lead specific areas. What can you commit to doing differently or better to ensure more effective and efficient police service? I want to start with Mr. Singh. Ms. Mr. Singh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member. I, I first would like to put some things into context. I, I don't think that um, we had the opportunity to address some things that fundamental to the discussion of strategies that, that um, have worked. I, I want to put on record that in 2022, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service solved 2,607 serious crimes and 1,628 minor crimes. In 2023, we had 5,000 853 serious crimes being solved and 3,615 minor crimes being solved. That, those figures put significantly into context, in my own mind, that the police service is working and that the strategies from 2022 by those figures compared to the strategies in 2023 have resulted in significant improvement. Albeit, when you compare to an actual detection rate that is very public, it might, on the face of it, seem 
very disappointing. However, when you put into context the work and progress it has taken to move those matters, it gives the encouragement that the strategies that were implemented has resulted in this progress. Lovely to hear that, Mr. Singh, but you didn't answer my question. I what can you, you, as a leader in your own right, commit to doing better or differently to ensure a more effective and efficient police service? And I want to hear from each of you and the Commissioner last. Right. So forgive me, I actually put that into context as a precursor to demonstrate what worked in 2023. And what worked was better internal networking amongst division branches and units, resulting in more efficient deployment based on the intelligence we received in the interface with the various matters. You know, so internal networking for information, internal networking for resource um, deployment. So and you commit to ensuring sure that that continues that and expands. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Singh. Mr. Samaru. Mr. Samaru. Ooh, so I commit, looking at trends, looking at our strategic plan, looking at what's taking place, looking at even the public's comments. We, most of the licks we're getting so far is customer service. And committing to enforce change so that we will improve customer service, inclusive of training. But that is your comment because next time we come back, I want to ask you where you are at, uh, Mr. Simon. Perhaps I can answer your question in, in the in the recent past as acting uh, deputy commissioner of police. Uh, in that role, uh, what what I brought was dedication and commitment, not not just to to the executive of the police service, but to the entire police service as a number of policies were rolled out from that office you know, under, under my charge. And uh, it remains my commitment, my dedication to, to creating and uh, perhaps bringing about a number of innovative styles in policing, causing, taking our policing levels from one to the, to the other. I have identified that we need to be to, to transform this TTPS to be a, a unit at police service that can investigate the, the higher and different levels of crimes. What we had found was that we had our specialized units doing all of these uh, intricate, intricate crime investigations and our other units, perhaps in the divisions and so on, were really, really far remote from, from what it is the, the specialized units can do. And what I did there was sort of bridge that gap. And uh, my... My uh, promise, perhaps, is that you know to continue along that line as far as um, I'm able to, to to render that support to the to the, the, the commissioner and, and anyone else in the in the executive. Thank you. I commit to lead from in front. I commit to provide the strategic leadership that the organisation needs to transform. The organization. Member Sukai. Thank you, Chair. Um, before, I want to, um, my relationship with Senior Soup goes way back to my last incarnation as Chamber President. And I could say some of the initiatives that he had for Shugona Central Division did yield good results. So I, I know you have my support in terms of your ability to execute. However, I just have a little suggestion when it comes to the school and school violence. There was a show long ago called 21 Jump Streets where they actually incorporated young, and I don't know how much people remember, but 21 Jump Street was a, a very, a, a, that little sitcom had a, 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 a profound effect in terms of school violence, how they reduce it. They looked for champions within the schools and I've spoken to a lot of the teachers, and they know exactly when they actually start to stagger times to, to end school, because you know what? They don't want um, rivaling gangs in schools to meet with one another. And maybe it would be a good idea to start looking to have these champions, give them some sort of you know, um, privilege, and, and that, that, that what comes with being an officer, a junior officer, 
so that they could start doing the work, you know, as, 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 as members of the force of TTPS. And it's something that you all could look at. It's a strategy, and that is my suggestion. Thank you, Chair. So it wasn't a question, it was a suggestion. Madam no, Lachmedia. Um, a, a question and a suggestion. The app spoken about earlier um, by member Sukai, it was called the um, See Something, Say Something. I think that was the tagline of it. Um, I, I could boast to my relationship with Senior Soup goes even before he was in Central Division. And I want to say as well, and I commend the way that you articulated what you have done, because I, being a practitioner, I have actually seen um, some results based on what you've spoken about in terms of connecting and making a closer connection between the specialized units. But there was a point in time where specialized units were performing at one level and the rest of the service performing at a very, very different level. And the average citizen having to interact with the um, non-specialized units were not getting the level of service that they deserved. And so I commend you for that initiative and I encourage you to, to continue with it, um, Senior Soup Simon. Um, and I have all confidence that you'll be able to be successful in your initiatives based on what I know you are capable of. Um, apart from that app, though, are there any mechanisms in place for members of the public to anonymously make reports of, one, what they see in terms of information for the TTPS in terms of crimes and to, and to really preserve their anonymity? And secondly, and more importantly, I think to report instances of police um, misbehavior or um, instances where they have um, poor interactions with police officers and so on because I believe that again coming back to public trust and confidence the lack of public trust and confidence has resulted in a, a, a dearth when it comes to um, you know information or total lack of information coming forward from members of the public which is critical um, in terms of the timely um, solving of crimes um, so if there isn't any other resource available, I would suggest that you all implement something like that. I know there's crime stoppers and those things, but again, there's not a, a, a great deal of confidence from what I hear from members of the public um, in terms of dealing with that. There are very few officers, and again, I know Officer Simon, Officer um, Deputy Commissioner Sam Rue would know that there are informants who have particular relationships with police officers that they may feel comfortable um, moving forward and, and coming to them with information. But if you don't know and have a personal relationship with that officer, it may be difficult for members of the public. So can technology not enable a more um, anonymous way for persons to make reports about crimes in general and particularly where there's um, you know, allegations of misconduct on the behalf of police officers? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for, for the, the question and the suggestion and, the, and perhaps opening the discussion. Uh, recently, I, I went to, the, to San Diego for the ISCP meeting. That is a meeting with commissioners of police throughout the world. And um, this was one of the discussions that came up about the use of apps for reporting and interactions with the police. And what I find was dominating in the discussion was the, the abuse of the apps and uh, how it's being misused by the public and even perhaps in some instances the police. And uh, what I found with the same app that we had and, uh, was that uh, these abuses and misuse were common also in Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I found also that a number of the, what was being reported on the app was so definitely, a, there was a disconnect then with what was being reported in the TTPs. There was a disconnect in even being able to, to prove and, I, and, and locate the reports. And that sort of kept back what it is we were able to do in terms of our responding to the information coming out there. And aside from that, the, the, the app itself was an exorbitant cost. Now, I have spoken to the, to the heads, the both heads of our IT, and what they have told me is that we can create something that uh, would be far cheaper than, than what we have. But what we have decided to do in realizing how the, these apps are misused is create something that would be, that we'll be able to change, you know, quickly so that when the misuse starts, we can go to something else. So, so that, that is part of our discussions going forward with using, using apps. 
Well, just no, I'll, I'll, I can make one suggestion. Oh, yes. Perhaps as an interim, though, then um, maybe one that the police can use to communicate quickly with the public, for example, for tips. So let's say a high-profile kidnapping takes place. Immediately, the app could be used so that you yes. only receive reports relative to this, whether they are anonymous or the person chooses to give information. But, you know, something that can give a quick a quick way for the public and, to announce. Yeah. And, and, and that, that is, I, I thank you for that. That is the idea in going forward with what it is we want, we want to do. How, how soon? We want to... How, hold on. Yes. And because of time. Yes, sir. We want a timeline. How soon can the public expect the rolling out of that? I... I, I wouldn't want to give that, that time. No, I, I know that... It, I know quarter, that... Um, an, an estimate. See, perhaps... I was expecting on my return to, to this jurisdiction just a couple of weeks, well, one week ago, actually, that that conversation would resume so that we can execute that quickly, and it shouldn't be taking too long. So perhaps in a, in, in, in a month time, I would see what, what is happening, you know, where, where actually we can be with that. Member Munilal. Thank you very much. Um, just on the same question, so at, at, at this moment, there is no online reporting, there is no TTPS app, there is no SOS a police app or anything functional now. They're all being reviewed. No, there, there is um, on, online reporting. You can report online. That but continues? Yes, yes. You can re report online. And what has been um, the success of that? What has been the, um, the report on that? Uh, the reporting online, I, find, I have found that um, it tends to be a, a, a bit slow, and, a, and I think it's necessarily because the, the information has been supplied. Perhaps it's a lack of understanding, you know. So, so perhaps we may need to relook the situation and see if we need to make it make the information source more user friendly. That could be an issue, and uh, so you know, with these things, you always have to be surveying and resurveying yes. to see the to identify, uh, of course, the disadvantages in these things. Would you tell the, the public what can be expected relative to the measures that will be engaged by the police to ensure public safety? I'm piggybacking from Member Richard's question. And the reduction in criminality in Trinidad and Tobago. In 2024. Again, I would like to assure the public that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, we are committed, we are committed to ensuring the safety and security of the nation in, at all quarters. We continue. What are you going to do? That is your commitment. Tell us, give us two concrete plans, concrete suggestions that would deal with the reduction of crime and persons feeling safer in their homes. Two. Mr. Chair, as I indicated before, we have a number, a limited, a relatively small number of offenders, and we commit to, to continue to target these offenders who are responsible. And of course, we're going to use all the available, and we are reviewing our, our technology to utilize the technology. Additionally, as we continue, we know that, our, that firearms, we know that gangs, guns, and drugs, they are the major issues that challenge us so that we are focusing on reducing, reducing the firearms, and the drugs. Committee respectfully requests targets in writing and realistic targets in writing relative to this plan, please, so that when we report, we can say these were the targets presented to us. This is the audit. This is the achievement. Do you undertake to do that, please, ma'am? Yes, I so undertake. Madam Commissioner, it is we, we have gone into extra time. I want to first thank you and your team today. You, you led your team today. And we want to thank you for appearing before us at this very 
dynamic time in Trinidad and Tobago. We want to thank you and your team. We, we get it that you are committed, and we were very warmed to your response that you would lead from, from the front. Members of the committee, I want to thank you all, and particularly Member Lachmi uh, Is Is the name still, it stays as is, madam? We will have to hyphenate her name, and as the old people would say, put title now to her name. And let us congratulate Member Lachmedial. <laughs> and I want to say to the public of Trinidad and Tobago, the, the, the commitment of this committee, Member Lachmedial, was part of a very, uh, a very rare celebration. We, and she, we impressed upon her the need to return to Trinidad and Tobago for this. And she did. And she returned at a specific time. And I want to commend everybody for the commitment. This committee, Madam Commissioner, is about doing the work in Trinidad and Tobago. We really do require a reduction in criminal activity. And we want it to be seen. The, I, I can tell you that there are four residents of Woodbrook, old people, people 83, 84. And it saddened me when they had to move out of their homes that they lived in for over eight decades because of home invasions. We need you to stop those invasions. We need you to do it, not just in Woodbrook, in Shogwanis, wherever it occurs, we need you to stamp it out. A businessman lost his son at a home invasion. We need that to stop. But we take the positive. We always end with a sense of hope. We are very, we, we, are, we are encouraged by your approach. We are encouraged by your obvious morphing. And we want to thank you for attending today. We want to thank the listening public. And we want to thank, well, when we thank you, we thank your team also. And members, we would want, I would want to thank you all, particularly for the preparation. And of course, the staff who worked behind the scenes to produce the research. Madam Commissioner, we would ask you to submit in writing, give us a, a, a relatively um, we'll give a modest period about a month. Is that enough time for you? We'll write, we'll write. We'll write, and we will ask you to respond thereafter. I would want to bring this part of the meeting, this aspect of the meeting, to an end, and we will resume in camera. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. You're most welcome, Chair. Uh, yeah.